Go ahead if you have your Bibles. I hope you do. I hope you bring your Bible every Sunday, whether it's on your phone or not. I can't do the phone thing. I've tried. I'm just too old. I got to feel it. I got to touch it and turn it. Something about engaging the senses. I need to touch it as well. Yeah, that's better. You did good. Um, but bring your Bible. Bring the Word of God. We, we want to be uh, mature in the things of the Word. And so, Father, I thank you for your Word. And I thank you for the Holy Spirit, the teacher who teaches us the Word. And we ask that you would magnify your Son, that you would conform us into his image, and that even now you would teach us everything he said, everything he did, and that you would grow us up into the head, into a perfect man, that we would be filled with the knowledge of his will, finding out what fully pleases him. So teach us your ways in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, go ahead and open your Bibles to John chapter 15. We're in the second part of a series we're looking at the subject of pruning, a great subject of trial. And in this chapter we looked at last week, we, looked, we introduced the subject of pruning, really, that Jesus in John chapter 15 is in the middle of preparing his disciples for change in season. So last week we talked about that there are many seasons in the grace of God. How many of you know that? You've lived long enough to go, oh, there's, there's seasons. And, and uh, oftentimes, the, the good ones can seem short. But the Lord does have seasons. There's season of planting and reaping. There's seasons. And the Lord has brought the disciples into an unprecedented three and a half years of fruitfulness where nothing of the enemy would harm them. He called it an open heaven where Satan fell like lightning and nothing of the evil one could harm them. Can you imagine that season where they would tell him, hey, Herod wants to see you, and he'd say, go tell that fox, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to do that, and there's nothing he can do. Imagine that kind of season. Unprecedented prosperity. Whoever touched the hem of his garment was healed. When he said, come out, they came out. When he taught the word, demons would manifest and he would break their power and cast them out and tell them to shut up. They did not have any power over the anointing that came out from him. He would then release that anointing and give it to the 12 and then to the 70, to 120, and the words going out with power all over the region, feeding of 4,000, of 5,000, walking on water, Nothing could stop him. And then Jesus tips them off that the season is about to change. And he calls it the hour of the power of darkness. And so at the Lord's Supper, he's preparing them for this season change. And he's emotionally prepping his disciples that they would understand the season change and that they would be able to embrace the purpose of it and receive all that God has planned for them. Because in the next three days, Jesus is going to look like he's dead and the promises are dead. But when Jesus is not seen, Jesus is going to say, it's the time to trust me like never before. And so he's prepping them for the shift. And so after the Lord's Supper, Jesus is going to say, you believe in God, believe also in me. Let your hearts not be troubled. You believe in God. That's good that you believe in God. A vague sense of God, a general view of Yahweh. But you're going to need to believe more in just a general sense of God. Can you believe in the God of Jesus? The God who lets his Messiah die. The God who brings the Messiah into suffering before his glory. Do you believe in that God? A lot of people believe in God. They just don't believe in the God of Jesus. The God who, whose pattern is crucifixion and resurrection. 
Glory to glory is on the inside, while the outward man is perishing. <laughs> so we, we don't, nobody has a problem with God. If you want to talk to anybody about God, you can do that at any time. Nobody gets mad at you. Then mention Jesus. Have you ever noticed how there is no other religious figure that is attached to a curse word? Nobody says Buddha, dang it. <laughs> Muhammad. Nobody does that. No one. Joseph Smith. God, ah, Joseph. Nobody does that. But the name Jesus is where the revelation is. It's where the power is. It's where the deliverance is. And so that's the name. And Jesus goes, you believe in God, but I'm going to ask you to believe in me. Even when it looks like I'm dead. When I'm not visible, will you believe in me? And at that point, in chapter 14, he's going to announce to them this reality in verse 30. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. But look at this. And he has nothing in me. That's why we're here today, because the evil one had nothing in Jesus. He lived a sinless, perfect life so he could give a worthy sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, and that if you believe on him, you will not perish but your sins will be forgiven and you'll be given everlasting life if you trust in him. That's the good news right there. But Jesus says, the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me, but he's speaking to disciples who for the last six months, their issues have been popping up from under the surface. And the inference here is, hey, the ruler of this world's coming. It's the hour of the power of darkness. When the Father, in His sovereign dealings, will allow for the crucifixion of it and everything that surrounds it. He will allow it, and when He does, the ruler of this world, had He known, He would not have crucified the Lord of glory, but He didn't. And the events were set into motion, and the inference is, the ruler of this world's coming, He has nothing in me, but you guys, He has things in. It's going to be a rough three days for y'all. <laughs> that's, the, that's the issue. It's going to be a rough three days for y'all. He doesn't have anything in me, so even death has no power over me. Even though he slayed me, it doesn't matter. He has nothing in me. I have eternity. There's nothing he can do. But you guys, mm -hmm. some things are going to show. Some things are going to come to the surface. And in the midst of that storm, I need to introduce you to a new season. It's called pruning in the ways of God. So in verse 1 of chapter 15, he says, I'm the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am in the vine, you are the branches. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. But if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. For by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. And so Jesus, in this chapter is introducing them to a season they aren't familiar with. It's called pruning. You know, I, I've heard this passage preached on many times, but most often it's taught abiding, just strictly abiding. I'm the vine, you're the branches, you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. 
But if you don't abide in me, you can do nothing. And every branch that doesn't bear fruit will be cut off and thrown into the fire. Well, most of the time, I don't hear that massive part in there called pruning. I just hear, hey, you need to abide. And then they go into a kind of a, 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 what we would call a systematic treatment of abiding or intimacy or what you need to do to abide. And yet Jesus is linking two crucial uh, uh, concepts here. The first is abiding, and the second is it's equated with pruning, which we don't usually talk about. We, we would rather talk about abiding. But Jesus goes, hey, I need to let you know a part of abiding that has exponential growth factor to it. So that you don't get confused when it comes. Because if you live long enough, it will come. You know, everybody, and I talked last week about everyone in here, will go through at least two to three bone-crushing, earth-shaking crisis. Where it's hard to find God. And the promises look gone. And everything around you falls apart. And, and I said last week, if you're, if you're too young to have had that happen, there's really good news for you. <laughs> there's years to come. Now, the good news is, is that God works all things together for good, that those who love him are called, called according to his purpose. And so God is so kind that he uses what everybody goes through for your benefit. For an unbeliever, it means nothing. You can go from hardship to hardship, from bitterness to bitterness, from despair to despair to despondency to more despondency to more despair to have a little reprieve right before you go back to more despair. And yet God in his kindness in a fallen world gives even the most horrible human experience the opportunity to escort you into greater perfection in Christ. That's a kindness that we can't just turn our backs on and go, hey, because whether you are a Christian or not, you will suffer in this life. That's an equal opportunity employer. <laughs> the evil one does not care whether you are a Christian or not. You know why he hates you? You're a human made in the image of God, not whether you're Buddhist or Christian. He hates everyone with a perfect hatred. Buddhists suffer as much as you suffer. Muslims suffer today. Families are being destroyed. Famine hits spiritists and animists just as much as it hits anywhere else. He destroys with war. Famine, disease, division, brokenness, abuse, oppression, conflict, murder. He's a liar and a murderer from the beginning. And what he hates is you bear the image. You have the likeness and similitude of the Almighty and that he longs to be with you. Now, when you become a Christian, you, you, you have a special bullseye on you. It's like a double bullseye, but hey, everybody's got a bullseye. That's my point. And God uses it for his children to mature you in love, which is a kindness. That's what we talked about last week. Then we answered the question of, because there's really uh, uh, three questions that we have to answer when dealing with this subject. And I set forth last week that we are in a season where the Lord is disciplining his church. You don't even have to have an ounce of discernment to know the Lord is shaking his church. You can just read Hebrews 12. He's going to shake everything that can be shaken. You can go to Haggai and just read it right there. He will shake heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land, till nothing but the kingdom remains. Period. You can go to 1 Peter 4.17, judgment begins in the house of God. You can go to Revelation and read that the spirit and the bride, they say, come, and he is going to make her ready for his coming, dressed in white, right? 
that we're going to be Ephesians 4, 13. We're going to have the five-fold ministry to equip believers till they reach the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God till they grow up in a perfect man. Therefore, do not be shocked, my dear flock, when you experience trials and tribulations. For did I not tell you that you would enter the kingdom of God through many tribulations? That even the son learned obedience in the things that he suffered, Hebrews chapter 5. So we talked about pruning. We answered the question of, how do you know when you're in a season of pruning? Today we're going to look at what's the purpose of pruning. And the next time I preach, we're going to look at how do you cooperate with it? If you know you're in it, and you understand the purpose... It's not enough just to understand the purpose. You actually have to cooperate. How many of you know you have to cooperate with the Spirit? You know, there's kind of a, there's kind of a, a, a thought process, which is this, that the Lord just overcomes you so that you get saved, and then, and then we kind of drop off the mat. You can't resist Him. If He wants you saved, you just get saved, and then we're just left to duke it out in sanctification. You mean he could overpower me when I was totally resistant, but now that I've said yes, he can't help me? Hey! My point is, it's not determinism. You actually have to cooperate with the Spirit. As a believer, you actually have to go, oh, that's the ways of God. Oh, okay, okay, this is the purpose. Here's how I cooperate. Here's how I, here's how I act in this season. I want to grow up into maturity. I want to understand What are the schemes of the evil one? And I don't understand the ways of God. Why? So when I find myself here, I know what to do. And I actually do it. I'm not just tossed to and fro on every wind of doctrine and every practice. Paul said, you know my doctrine and my life. Now hold to the doctrine and follow my life. You got to do it, Timothy. Stir yourself up in your most holy faith. Remember the prophetic promises over you. For by them you can wage the good warfare. you got to do something, young man. Don't be afraid. It's for this moment. You were born, Timothy. Step into it, young man. Do it. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. You know what to do. You've seen me. Do it. That's what Paul's saying. He's a good dad. He's going, hey, you're my son. You know what to do. Do it. Do it. Just do it. Do it, please. But we've got to cooperate. Or we just kind of, just kind of, I don't know what this word is. You just kind of, like an amoeba, you just kind of float and just like a pinball, just being tossed to and fro. No, you actually, whatever the measure that we actually impact everything around us, we don't know that. We're not that smart. God in his grace hasn't told us the the balance between free will and sovereignty, all we know is how we act really matters. And the amount of knowledge we can attain really impacts what we choose. And if we choose wisely, we reap blessings. And if we choose poorly and stay in ignorance, we get poor results and ignorant results. And so we've got to know these things. That's why we teach the Word, so we can grow up. So the first thing that we talked about last week, and then I'll move forward, is how do you recognize you're in a season of pruning? And just to cover it for those of you who weren't there, I don't know about you, but when you, James says this, consider it all joy, brethren, when you fall into various trials. And I'm like, that is such great language. Because that's how trials happen. You just fall into them. (laughs) <laughs> How many of you prepped for the trial, knew the trial, you saw it coming, and said, oh, that's the trial. It's going to be here in two weeks. I think I'll just slide into it. I'll just ease into the trial. No, that's not how trials come. Trials, you fall into them. You go, what the heck? What? Joseph Smith. That was awesome. That was awesome. (laughs) That was awesome. (laughs) 
No, that's you fall into them. And because you fall into them, you're disoriented. And the saints don't do well at the beginning when they fall into them. It takes you a little while to get your bearings, and then you're like, whoa, I think I'm in a season change. <laughs> How'd you know that, brother? You lost your house? Your wife moved out? Kids don't like you? Doesn't take much discernment. <laughs> no, but you fall into them. You go, what? And all the strongholds and blinders that got you there, suddenly you're there, and now... What was under the surface is exposed. And so I don't know about you, but when I fall into trials, I don't always know, is this God? Did God's sovereignty bring me here? Is this the rage of Satan? Or is this my sin? Or another one, is this y'all's sin? <laughs> I mean, we don't talk about that one that we actually do impact one another. It's God's sovereignty, Satan's rage, my sin, our sin. And I don't know if it's you, but when I get in these kind of issues, I don't know whether to just entrust myself to God and say, thank you, start rebuking the devil, repenting of my sin, or confronting us. And so at the very beginning, I remember, especially in my 20s and 30s, I'd just do them all. Thank you, God. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, Satan. And I would just search my heart and then, mm-hmm. Who do I need to talk to? They opened the door. My spiritual authority must have opened the door to something. <laughs> and so I'd just do them all. But I, I want to give you some, a, a little tip on how you can know when you're in a season of pruning, and, and it's really quite simple. And, and just match it with the natural pruning. Nobody goes by a tree and wonders if it's been pruned. If you go by a tree or a plant, branches are cut off. You never go by a tree and go, oh, I wonder what happened to that. Was that a tornado? No, that's a clean cut. It's pruned. Why? Because of loss. It's lost branches. It's clear. And beloved, you know you're in a season of pruning by the Lord when you suffer loss. It's one of the main indicators. As a matter of fact, a season of pruning brings a loss of finance, possessions, impact, Influence, position, stature, relationship, and opportunity. In fact, to be pruned is to lose the basis by which everybody else evaluates you as successful. <laughs> well, brother, I hadn't seen you in a long time. What's going on? Mm-hmm. A lot's happened. And then you share your story, and you know they're walking away going, that brother must have, he must be in sin. <laughs> I mean, all hell broke loose on his life. My goodness. Da -da -da. And the next thing you know, you're like Job's friends. The point is, when Job was pruned, everybody around him deemed him as unsuccessful, unfit. And the entire time God was going, no, I'm pruning Job. I'm taking him to the next level. You see, various trials diminish resources and make secondary and less important pursuits impossible. And the process of loss on multiple fronts produces weariness, fear, and despair. Anybody ever been in that place where everything that gave you security, reputation, stability was removed, and you hate to even tell your story to people because you know what's going to... 
they just kind of give you the look like, ooh, glad, that's, glad I'm not in that season. <laughs> Is, am I the only one? Y'all are looking at me like I am the only one today. <laughs> Your reputation can be maligned. You can lose finances. You can lose standing, or maybe it's opportunity. This is the time. The open door was in front of me. It closes. But it's in that place, the testing of our faith. And so today I want to look at the fourfold purpose of pruning. Now, Wes gave us three great illustrations from natural pruning at the end of the service last time. I think he he said it was... your, the gardener prunes for fruitfulness, health, and beauty. Fruitfulness, health, and beauty. I'm going to look at John 15, four things from John 15 that Jesus is going to say this is the purpose. And why, why, why do I want to give you the purpose? I don't know about you, but I cooperate better when I know why. I don't know if you were one of those kids. I was. Why? 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 You need to do this. Why? I, I, why? Why? Anybody? Anybody that kid or you had that kid? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got three of those kids. Every one of them was a wire. Why? But what's the fourfold purpose? Jesus said, I tell you these things beforehand so that when you get in them, you can be obedient. So we want to know these things beforehand so that we can be obedient in the midst of it. Uh, Because suffering is both the context and the fruit of a fallen world. Everybody experiences suffering. Knowing this, we can rest in the truth that the Lord uses every season. Now hear me. When you're a believer, the Lord uses every season to produce love in your heart. That's his commitment to you. That's the evidence that you're his son or daughter. He can use great pain. How many of you have experienced great pain and found yourself in the midst of the greatest pain feeling the closest to Jesus? So much so that when the season shifted and you weren't in great pain, you actually are glad you're out of the season, but you're sad that you don't feel as close. Anybody felt that? You young people, it's when you break up with a girl you thought you were going to be married to or vice versa. And in that place, you say, oh, God. And next thing you know, your heart's burning. You're feeling close to you. You draw near him. It's just like that. Why? Because the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He's near to the humble and contrite. He just comes close, and it's almost, it's like, have you ever fasted to where you get in that place where you're more aware spiritually, and there's this sense of discernment, and you're, your, your spirit's buzzing. You're just like, ah, oh, you want to evangelize everyone and you want to, just want to live for Jesus all the time. You're, like, ah. You're buzzing spiritually. And then you, but you want to break the fast. At the same time, you're buzzing. You're ready. You're counting down the 21 days. You're like, ah. And then you break it. You're excited. And then that dullness comes on. You're like, ah. Where'd you go? Sugar is the hindrance. To intimacy with Jesus. Yeah, there, there's something like that because he, he draws near. But here's the point. Here's the promise to you. You have the promise that every season of the soul, God uses it to make your heart bigger in love if you'll cooperate. And the bigger the shaking, the more expansion of your heart he can pull off. There's a direct correlation to the measure of the trial and the measure of the exponential growth in love if you'll say yes to him. Now, I'm saying that so you can have understanding. It doesn't necessarily make you feel better when you're in the trial. When you're in the trial, you're like, dang, Joseph Smith. Darn it. It's hard. But I tell you, there's something when the Spirit will nudge you and go, to the measure of the trial, Alan, will be the measure of the exponential growth in your heart if you say yes to me right now. 
Here's why. And I say this. I'm going to say this a million times if you get to know me at all, which is this. It is a kindness that you get to love him right now in the trial because it's the only small window of eternity that you get to do it. Do you know in the next stage, which for you and me, it's going to be 70 years, 80 with strength. And beloved, I'm 54, so that ain't long. My window's closing, and I only have a few decades to love him in the trial, in faith. And that's why faith is so precious. You know, in the next age, you won't love him by faith. You'll love him by sight. <laughs> But you know how precious it is? He said to Thomas, blessed are those who do not see and believe. In fact, Peter calls that kind of faith golden faith. Do you have any idea the, the preciousness to God when you love him when most human beings don't? When most human beings will accuse him, you actually love him. It moves him. Jesus said, I've never seen such faith like this in all of Israel. It moved him. The, the fact that you could offer God something that's rare on the earth, now in the trial. And the exponential factor it is. And so the first thing that we look at, Jesus says very clearly in verse 2, he says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. But here he's going to give us a purpose. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So the first purpose of pruning is this, to bear more fruit. In other words, you need to be encouraged when you find yourself in the pruning season. Why? You're not being pruned because you failed. You're being pruned because you are fruitful. Did you ever see that where he goes to, he, uh, uh, what's his name, Lazarus dies, and it's going to say twice that Jesus really loved Lazarus. And your big question is, well, Jesus, why do you choose the ones you love to kill? <laughs> it's like, like, choose a Pharisee, kill him, <laughs> then raise him up when his body's rotted. Instead, you choose your closest friends that you're going to spend the night with on the Passion Week, you're going to choose him to kill. I mean, you've, you've got the very first written book of the Bible is, have you considered my servant Job, Satan? Ah! You know, there's one context you don't want your name mentioned. <laughs> when God's talking to Satan, have you considered my friend? Fill in the blank. You're like, no, don't consider me. No, let's not consider right now. <laughs> let's just keep doing what we're doing. But God chooses you to prune you, not because you're unfaithful and unfruitful, because you're fruitful. The unfruitful branches he cuts off and throws into the fire. That should encourage you right away when you find yourself in the pruning season to go, he chose me. Why? Because he sees not only fruit, he sees the potential for more. The fruitfulness of it all. That I, I, I tell you, there's more people that when they get in the shaking, they just... Whoa. No, you don't have to do that. You don't have to. You can fall... Uh, how do I say it? You can fall into the trial with the understanding that he's making you more fruitful. The unfruitful branches aren't pruned. They're destroyed. But the fruitful branches are pruned. Now, here's the very next sentence. is really important that you understand it's because you're fruitful that you're pruned. Because in the pruning process, especially at the beginning, in the midst of the loss and the wariness and the warfare... The evil one comes to whisper to us that it's your fault you got yourself here. You're in this because he's displeased. You're in this because 
you blew it. You're the problem. And the evil one will come, and he'll not only inflict the warfare of the circumstance, and God in his sovereignty will allow it, he'll then come and mistreat. How many of you know he enters Judas, gets him to portray, betray Jesus, and then he turns around and gets him to kill himself? He doesn't even reward his servants. He's a murderer from the beginning, a liar and a murderer. And so therefore, when they find yourself in the trial, the evil one will come and now he will whisper in your ear, God is mostly mad and mostly sad concerning your life. He's not in this and you put yourself there. And in the midst of that warfare, usually believers don't do so well the first couple months. Have you ever noticed I could go through a pattern in the Bible where Abraham, he goes, Abraham, leave to a land that I promised to you, leave your father's house. Abraham goes, as soon as he's in the land, he builds an altar, and you're like, hey, we're good to go now. And then it, the very next verse is, and a famine came to the land, and Abraham had to go to Egypt. And you're like, whoa, wait, wait. You told the man to leave his father's house. You're going to bring him into a land and bless him and make his descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And the moment he builds an altar and says, thank you for bringing me safely to the land, you kick him out of the land with a famine. And now he's in Egypt where his wife is about to be in the harem of the Pharaoh. You're like, whoa. Little did he know at that point, if you were Job's friends, you could come and say, Abraham, you brought yourself here. You did this. God's displeased with you. What you don't know is God set up the whole thing so that Abraham, Abram can become Abraham and walk out of Egypt with all this gold and wealth by Pharaoh. The trial's going to end with a double blessing, but you can't perceive it on the front end. So beware if you're Job's friend. Be very slow to accuse because we frankly don't know a lot, and I would say that to all of you if you live in a community, be very slow to accuse Job. When you look at one another, don't look with those critical eyes. Because sometimes you don't know. Is it Job, or is it Judas, or is it somebody else, or is it some, you hear what I'm saying? So just be slow. Because you could find yourself speaking against the dealings of God. And you needed to be the encourager in the midst of the warfare. But most of the time, the saints, when you get into it, you get weary, you get overwhelmed, you're confused, and you don't know what to do, and you don't know why you got here, and the evil one will come and whisper to you, you did this, you made the wrong move, you did that, 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 that. But Jesus wants to let you know right off the bat, hey, guys, you're about to be pruned, you're about to go through a serious trial, but here's the good word, you're clean because of the word I've given you. You're like, what? Clean? Peter's about to deny you. Judas has betrayed you. Everybody else is going to run off. And you're saying they're clean? And in John 17, over and over, he's going to say, Father, they're clean. They're sanctified. And then suddenly you realize, he tells you in John 17, Father, they're sanctified. Why? Because I'm sanctified and they're with me. You're like, oh, good, I'm with Jesus. <laughs> this is my plan to produce fruit in their lives. I've arranged the next three days in the sovereign purpose with you, Father, where they're going to be sifted and tried. Their fault lines are going to be exposed, and yet they will have lost nothing. Why? It's my plan, and I'm the Lord. And I prune their branches. I didn't prune them because they did wrong. I pruned them because they did right, and I'm helping them answer the very cry of their heart to be holy as I'm holy. Bearing more fruit. Okay, there's a lot more we could say on that. Secondly, seasons of pruning demonstrate the true source of one's fruitfulness. Look with me here down at verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches, he who abides in me, and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. 
If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered. They gather, gather them and throw them into the fire. They are burned. Now, here's the point here. If you've ever entered into a pruning season, the loss brings a swift humility to your perspective. How many of you know in the fruitful season, it's just a little easier to kind of stick your chest out? Somebody shares they're struggling. You go, man, I'm glad I'm not like that dude. Man, I'm glad I dealt with that a long time ago. Glad the Lord showed me how to deal with that issue. That We have a lot of religious language. But in the fruitful season, there's a tendency to get confused between what was the Lord and what was you. My gifting, my talent, my insight, my hard work. And the pruning season reminds you, hey, the life is in the vine. And you embrace humility again because of loss. It's the loss that restores the humility. You see, in a season of prosperity, we can easily believe that the fruitfulness comes from our labors, our strategies, and our talents. But what did the psalmist say? Unless the Lord builds the house, you what? Labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, your watchmen watch in vain. But the Lord gives sweet sleep to those whom he loves. <laughs> when you understand it's the Lord, and I don't know about you, but I've gone through enough seasons where the Lord reminded me, he's the vine. It's about him. And in that place, you discover, you know what? You were what I really wanted anyway. How many have been on the threshold of breakthrough and the Lord in his kindness went, nope. And you found yourself getting cut again. <laughs> and the Lord went, oh, I so love him. I so love him. I'm, 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 I'm just going to help him right at the beginning. Because <laughs> I, I remember I was on my honeymoon. And uh, I had just, right before my honeymoon, I had carried a bunch of, uh, what is it called, uh, Suit, big suitcases up to like uh, the fourth floor of my sister's apartment, and I tore my diaphragm, the muscle that helps you breathe. How many of you know when you tear your diaphragm, it's not a pleasant experience because you have to breathe, people. You got tennis elbow, quit playing tennis. You tear your diaphragm, try not breathing. It just doesn't work. So I tear it right before my honeymoon. Horrible. Worst time ever to have any injury imaginable. <laughs> so I'm on my honeymoon, and I, they advertise this Christian bed and breakfast. And um, so I went to this Christian bed and breakfast, and as I walked in, it was uh, this charismatic Catholic lady. And so I walk in, and immediately she is a seer. And she just immediately begins, hey, welcome here. And oh, by the way, I see you have an injury on your side. <laughs> and I went, uh, yeah. And for the next two days, she would prophesy to us with such clarity things that are still coming true. She was baptized in the Holy Spirit. She was an intercessor. She sat me down and went, hey, you can't trust everything I'm saying. you got to weigh it with Scripture. you got to discern whether it's of the Lord. You need to pray over this and sat us down and we'll watch Brother Son, Sister Moon about St. Francis of Assisi. And she began to teach us on the gifts of the Spirit. I, I, I mean, you could have traded her out with, you know, Sam Storms or somebody that taught on the gifts of the Spirit. It sounded the same. I was like, oh, my gosh. But she looks at me. She goes, you got a, you got a, a, a thorn in your side. I go, what? She goes, yeah, you got an injury, like a literal injury. And I, I said, yes, ma'am. She goes, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a thorn in your side. I said, oh, what, what do you mean? She goes, you got an ego problem. The Lord says you have an ego problem. Okay. <laughs> and he's committed to helping you. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> 
He's going to prosper you in this, this, and that, but he's going to help you. He's going to help you to stay in that place where you understand that unless you abide in the vine, you can do nothing. And if you've ever been in that humble place, you realize just how little control. Let me tell you, you are free when you discover you have hardly any control over anything. You're free. One of the worst taskmasters, slave owners, is when you imagine that it's up to your performance. If you think it's dependent on you, boy, that's a rough taskmaster. Because what happens when you get acquainted with you? And you discover you ain't as oppressive as you thought you is, was, are. But I tell you, the Lord comes and he goes, he reminds us in the trial season that fruitfulness becomes, it comes because of him. And in that humility, the Lord really enjoys our broken and contrite heart. Because in our broken and contrite heart, we're reminded I'll say it this way, the fear of the Lord comes and says to us, hey, you think you're here, but you're really here. But because I love you, if you just humble yourself, I'd like to take you here. You think you're here, you're really here, but I really want to take you there. But the only way to go there safely is if I bring you here for right now. So that when I take you there, it's safe for you, and you don't fall to the same sin as the evil one. That's why Paul says, be careful, young people, that you don't put them up too quickly. Why? Lest they fall to the same temptation as the evil one. Beloved, I, I, man, I read that in my 20s. I was so scared. I'm not trying to get you scared. I want you to go for it. He had 20-year-olds on his apostolic team. It's not my point. I just read that. I went, oh, my gosh. Lord, I hope you're committed to preserving me for me. And the Lord goes, I am. I'm really good at it. It's called pruning. I'll help you. In fact, when you fall into pruning, rejoice because I'm doing a good work. You see, we're reminded of our great need for God and become grateful to him as our life source. I, how, how do I say this? We could spend a lot of time on it, but... The, Lord, the, the longer I live, the more I realize the Lord just really wants humility. It's the fragrance that attracts him and brings him. He wants our brokenness and reminds us of our great need for him. It reminds us that God did not call us because we were impressive. He called us in our weakness to display his glory. When you, hey, you, you want to know what a horrible yoke impressiveness is? Because once you try to put up that air that you're impressive, you've got to live in that. That's, I mean, that's, that's celebrity Christianity in a nutshell as we put the talented, impressive people up there, but they really know in their hearts they're not that impressive, but they've got to keep the machine going. I got, this mouth is what brings it in right here then that mouth is what it's got to keep feeding everybody. No. We've got to get over that. We're all in the same place. And when you discover you're not that impressive, but he's madly in love with you and wants to use you more than you want to be used, he just wants to use you safely. Beloved, if there's anything we learned, if he will stop Moses from going into the promised land, he'll stop all of us. He was the most humble man on the face of the earth, and God went, you're not safe to go in right now. If I let you in where you're at, Moses, it's going to harm you, and I'd rather give you more eternal rewards. That's how kind God is. But when you get set free, I mean, can you imagine the freedom of being delivered from the, the lie that you've got to be impressive? You just have to be yielded. You have to be humble, and that brings us to the third thing, and I have to speed it up. I'm sorry. 
Thirdly, Jesus explains that pruning causes a twofold movement of the word of God in our lives. I, I want to read this verse. It was very important that you understand this. I wish somebody had told me this when I was young. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. For by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and you will be my disciples. Look at this. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, the pruning process not only forces us to abide in the vine to know our source, but it brings us into what I call a twofold movement of the word in our lives. How many of you know the word that we learned in the previous season is what gets tested in the pruning season? You've got to understand what put you in the testing season was the previous revelation you got. Here's what I mean by that. How many of you have ever studied meekness in the word? I have a good friend, he studied meekness, gave himself praying for the cultivation of meekness in his life. And for a year as he prayed it and studied it and taught it, he came to me one day and he said, my life is a mess. This has been the hardest year of my life. He goes, I've been mistreated and betrayed and wronged. He goes, this is horrible. And he goes, and I was in my quiet time this morning, and the Lord told me, you asked me to form meekness in you. There's only one way to form meekness. Mistreatment. <laughs> meekness is the restraint of power for the sake of love when you're mistreated. So what's the moral of the story? Be careful what you pray for and what you study. No, it's not actually that. It's, hey, God wants the Word to become flesh. This is what I love about God. He's not an idea. He's a person. Therefore, He wants His Word to be fleshed out. How many of you know it's better to be humble than to understand humility? God is not the great idea. He's not an energy force. He's a person. That's why the Word is always looking to become flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh. If you don't get that down, you won't understand the ways of God. You'll be bitter and mad while you're in the trial. And the Lord's going, I want the Word that you studied in the previous season, I actually want to work it out in you. So if you study forgiveness, guess what? He'll help you get an opportunity to forgive. You're like, ah! You're going, but I'm studying a lot. Well, welcome! You're going to have a lot for the Lord to produce in you. Because He always wants to test the Word. So why? It becomes flesh. Because He's looking for the fourth thing, which is an intercessor. We think intercession is about words. It's not about words. It's about a person that stands before God and gets what he or she wants. Don't be surprised when God is fashioning you and forming you and pruning you and cultivating you and smashing you and crushing you. Why? He's looking for a vessel that whispers to him so that he can do it. You want language, he wants flesh. He wants the word made flesh so that you are the intercession. I, we got a whole generation that's trying to find language. That language you're praying is working to make you a person in his image. And he loves you so much, he won't leave you at the microphone. He'll meet you in the parking lot with your girlfriend and in the home with your wife. And with your friends that betray you, and with the na 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 na. Why? So the word can become flesh, so that in their humbleness and your brokenness, you just whisper things to the king. If you abide in me, and my word abides in you, you can ask the Father whatever you desire. Why? Because your desires have actually been changed. 
Do you know in James, Amen. he warns us of prayer that doesn't get answered. He says, you have not because why? You don't ask. And then you have not because when you ask, you ask according to your worldly desires. And he loves you too much to give you that. I asked my dad for a motorcycle when I was eight. <laughs> my friend had a motorcycle. I need a motorcycle. My dad said, no. You know what? I would have killed myself on that motorcycle because I had no restraint. Some of y'all, I am, a, I am a, what is it called? I wish my wife were here. Obsessive compulsive. When I do something, I just do it. I would have been jumping cliffs with that thing, ramps. I would have died within a week, I'm certain. And my father went, I love you, so no. I love you, no. I love you, no. No, no, I love you. We ask, but we ask amiss because our lives haven't surrendered to the cultivation of the word where God can just answer us. You know, it goes a step further. I, I don't think we truly understand the nature of intercession because we think of words as magic spells. If I just get the right combination of words. No, you, you know what you want? You want the right combination of God's character formed in you that you don't even need words. Where the Spirit has done the work in you and groans beyond words. It's you. <laughs> I, I can't. I, I remember when the Holy, I was looking for the right words for that situation. And it was like the Spirit said, It's you, Alan. It ain't your words. It's you. You know what David said? They hate me, but I, and your translations will say, I pray. But in Hebrew, it's two nouns. It's not I pray, a noun and a verb. It's actually I prayer. They return my love with hatred, but I prayer. In other words, I am prayer. It's me. Do you know what in Ezekiel 14, 12 to 14, what God said? This city has been so rebellious that even if Noah, Job, and Daniel were here, I would still destroy it, but I'd save them. Just them being there. Do, do, you, do you get the inverse of that truth, which is this? Wherever Noah's at, it's good. Wherever Daniel's at, it's good. Babylon's just fine. Daniel's there. Where Job's at, it's good. Do you understand a life of intercession because you've been formed by the Almighty in the place of pruning and in the place of trial? You've been pressed, tried, weighed, sifted, refined in the, in the refiner's fire. And the Lord goes, you don't even know it, but your life has become prayer. Because your desires have been shaped to his desires. You don't even have to say something. You know, Jesus, this Jesus in John chapter 11, it's one of my favorite verses on intercession. He says, I'm going to say this out loud for y'all's behalf. God's already heard me. Well, you ain't said anything. I did. You just ain't heard me. And then he says to God, you always hear my prayers. Wow. Jesus is not only the revelation of the Father to us, he's the revelation of us to his Father. Can you imagine that a man on earth could say, you always hear me. You always answer me. You imagine your life being conformed to the image of the Almighty in such a way your very life is intercession wherever you go. I remember this man, this, he's an Anglican priest now, but he was one of the premier youth evangelists in the nation. And I remember he went in to a McDonald's and there was this Harley, uh, what were they called? It's the old gang, I can't even remember. Um, Hell's Angels, the other one's the Outlaws, right? Hell's Angels. And he goes in and he sits down across from this big dude. I mean, big, tatted up dude. Sits down across from him, shares Jesus with him for about an hour. And he comes out and, you know, man, hooly, what? You know, 
<laughs> what happened? He goes, dude, it was amazing. Did he come to know Jesus? Not yet. Okay, I thought it was amazing. He goes, it was. You know why? That dude was three feet from Jesus the whole time. Okay, what do you mean? Jesus showed up like in McDonald's, Mickey D's? Jesus appearing to the Hell's Angels and Mickey D's? Let's, let's get a video of that, put that out. He goes, no, man. He goes, I was there. I was there. He was three feet from Jesus for an hour. He goes, man. That was powerful. I thought, oh, gosh. I go, that's the right perspective. He had an understanding. He is intercession. He is it. He's the Lord's friend. And I thought to myself, oh, my gosh. You mean if I go through pruning, I'll bear more fruit? I'll get connected that I don't have to be impressive? I get freed up from my performance mentality and celebrity Christianity? that he's the source of all things, and we're all in the same playing field, all level before God. We all play for the same rules. This is, you mean, I don't have to be impressive. I can just be weak Allen, and if I connect with you, you'll do it. Okay, I'm in. I'll sign up. And then three, there's a twofold movement. You mean the word I studied in the past, you're fleshing out in me so that my desires are right? And in the midst of the trial, I not only get fleshed out what I studied in the last season, I find out I don't know enough word for the next season, so I start studying the revelation that's going to help me in the trial, and that new study of that word becomes the catapulting of me into the next fruitful season. So we get tested on what we learned, and then we start to wrestle with questions we didn't and go to the word for the next season. You mean I get to flesh out what I learned and go deeper in what I don't know that could be the currency to purchase the next season of prosperity? Really? Okay. And then you realize in the trial is the exponential growth of the word. Like don't waste a good mistreatment. Don't waste a good trial. And did you know he'll form your desires in that place of dependency and the word to where your life becomes intercession? Did Job say the right words to get out of the season? Nope, he said the wrong words. And God showed up, corrected him, and then blessed him doubly. I find that a lot. <laughs> I get put in the trial. I'm trying, but it ain't all lining up. The Lord goes, hey, don't worry, I'm fleshing something out. You can't even see it, it's too deep. So that wherever you're at, I answer you as intercession. <sighs> Man, if you understood that, you wouldn't waste a good trial, would you? Now, why am I saying that? So we don't talk ourselves out in the midst of the trial with some kind of pop psychology. No, God really likes you. That's why you're here. I think he, no, he really likes you. That's why you're struggling. He really loves you. That's why you're experiencing this. Oh, and by the way, oh, I'm with you in it. And the Lord is going to produce more fruit. And don't worry, in the midst of your confusion and despair, you're clean. You're sanctified. Why? Because he's clean and he's sanctified and he's your Lord and he's the Lord of the season. Okay. And there's good news. He's going to let you flesh out what you set your heart to do. And then he's going to aid you to study the new revelation that's going to purchase the future prosperity. And then you're going to whisper things to him and he's going to say yes and answer your prayers. For by this, my father is glorified because why? It's the evidence you're his disciple now. Did you know when you respond to pruning in the right way, it's the evidence you're his disciple? So the question becomes, why waste a good pruning season? That's what I hear the Lord saying to me, Alan. I'm not done with you. Every time in, this, in the midst of this shaking right now, it looks like it's going to land. Peace will prevail, and it, it blows up. And the Lord goes, I ain't done. I'm going to get everybody on this one. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> I want to go deeper, Alan. Deeper. <laughs> Feels pretty deep. <laughs> really stinks. <laughs> this is horrible. <laughs> yeah, but hey, from my perspective, I'm bringing everybody to the point where they're not impressed with anybody. I'm telling you, if you've been through this last season and you're impressed with somebody, something's wrong with you. (laughs) Ain't nobody impressive. The Lord's just welcome to the hour of the power of darkness where I sift everyone and weigh everyone's hearts. Let all things come to the surface. Why? Because I ain't intimidated by it. I'll never forget it, and I'll close with this. Do you know the Holy Spirit spoke to me one day because I was in the midst of of the Lord revealing my weaknesses and, and really bringing things to the surface. And as if it wasn't enough to let me know about these weaknesses in my life, he let me know through other people knowing my weaknesses. That's when it stinks. When you get introduced to your weaknesses through other people seeing it. And in the midst of that season, I remember being just really down into despair, like, is this ever going to work? And I'll never forget it when the Holy Spirit said to me, Alan, I love my job. You might be discouraged, but I never grow discouraged. I love my job. I remember I, I was like so caught off guard. I went, what are you talking about? You can't love your job. I don't even like me. How could you like this? And he goes, I tell you to be cheerful, and all you do is unto the Lord. He said, I'm the most cheerful worker in the universe. I love to make you holy. I love to arrange your life. I'm setting you up right now for the trial in 30 years you don't even know about. I'm setting the whole thing up to make you glorious in love. Yeah, you might not be impressive to your friends, but you could be glorious in love. Because on that day when you stand before me, I'm going to ask you, did you learn to love, Alan? Not how big and impressive you thought your ministry was. I'm going to ask you how big your heart was. And he said, I tell you to be cheerful. I'm the most cheerful worker. I love making you holy. And when I expose your fault lines, just because you're shocked doesn't mean I'm shocked. (laughs) I've seen it the whole time. (laughs) I'm like, you have? How could you like me at all? But he's not. He loves that season. Are you hearing me? I want to pray for us. And I'll release you to, for your children. For Jordan, if you and the team could come up. It's, am I the only one that's burning up in this room? It's, y'all should have said something to me. Turn on the air conditioning, Alan. Somebody turn that on. Rachel, you're the gatekeeper of the AC. Now, that's the purpose. That doesn't mean you know how to cooperate yet. But we're going to look at that next time. How do we cooperate in a season of pruning so that we can accomplish the purpose that the Lord wants for it? Amen? Let's stand. Has this been okay to get in the Word like this? Okay, good. Hallelujah. Is that air on, Rachel? Praise God. I thought it was me. I thought, man, the fire of the Holy Spirit's in this room. <laughs> oh, if you're in that season, just sit, just stand before Him. Sometimes it helps me. You don't have to do this. You, you respond whatever way leads you. But I, I just like to put my palms up just to, I surrender to the season. You know, in this season, I, the Holy Spirit's just dealing with his body. I just keep hearing him say, I, I'm producing a work of truthfulness. I want honesty at the deepest level. I, I want to remove exaggeration. I want to move remove lying. I want to remove anything that's tainted. I, I, I want you to be honest. You may be in a different season where he's pruning greater trust. 
that he's your provider. You may be in another season where he's producing a work in you of forgiveness. You, you may be in a different season where the Lord's saying, I, I'm actually producing discipline in your life. I, I'm, I want you to do some things that are according to biblical wisdom. Just ask the Holy Spirit if you go, you know what? I'm in that season of pruning. I, I'm suffering loss. Everything by which uh, other people deem me successful is being removed. Just begin to talk to the Lord. Ask Him. Say, Lord, I want to cooperate with your purpose. 